Hello world. Frida Reba Darcy and Patricia O'Connor here. And it is our holiday weekend drop. And we're going to do uh, a little thing on uh, literati bujin bonsai. Um, why wouldn't I? As I stated, just I think in the last couple of videos, I am up to eight pine trees. And three of those guys are literati. This is Hondo, my 100 and 75 year old Yamadori Literati collected from Deadwood, South Dakota, not by me, but by uh, uh, Andrew Smith of Deadwood, South Dakota, a golden arrow bonsai, real pro. Uh, the other one, Hoss, that you see me brag about all the time was a part of that same acquisition at that same time. And here just recently, I acquired this guy in frame right now. This is a, I don't know how old, Japanese black pine. And I got this at the uh, club auction. I'm really happy to have it as well. It seems to be, to me, to be a little bit more, maybe of a modern representation. Yeah, I guess not, it still kind of fits in with that old school. But whenever we say literati, we could actually be saying, up to three different things. Uh, one, literati is not a style of bonsai. Uh, cascade, semi-cascade, formal, semi-formal, upright, uh, you know, raft, uh, all of those are styles. What uh, literati is, is an approach. It could be an uh, a literati, any one of those other things I just mentioned. It's an approach to a style, right? So, however, the name literati is uh, the name of the original thing that you would now call bonsai. Uh, what we enjoy as bonsai started in uh, China and uh, about more or less 2,000 years ago, when uh, some monks decided to go up into the hills and collect trees and put them in planters and bring them back and uh, discuss them and discuss how to keep them. And uh, that very quickly meant that they would decide by vote or whatever, they would discuss whether or not this limb stays or goes or whether or not they style it this way or that way or whether this was a good tree or whether this tree wasn't a good tree. And these guys were, even though they were, uh, they would have been monks, they would have been doing this as a matter of an art form for which there were many flourishing art forms at that time. Uh, 600 AD, we flash forward a few hundred years, 600 AD, Japan decides to expand its uh, boundaries. And uh, in so doing, it sends, uh, it sends diplomats and it sends craftsmen and it sends tradespeople <clears throat> out all over the world. And one of the places they went to early on was China. And I'm not really sure how much earlier on but like the Koreans before them, uh, because I think Korea has a similar story that's actually older than this Japanese version, uh, they were taken by the, uh, by the uh, art form that the Chinese monks had started. It was during this time that a lot of things were going on artistically. Um, there was, uh, uh, painting and there was music and there was uh, poetry and all of these things would have been uh, of the learned person and whereas if you were uh, you know in the west we refer to people as scholars then they referred to uh, them as uh, Bunjin 
which is a uh, learned man. And so this uh, literati would be the term for uh, uh, plants or horticulture for the learned man. Or they could have uh, um, a form of painting which was called Southern Song Painting. And that would have been literati painting or, or Bungin painting, painting for, uh, again, that same learned man. So that was kind of how that got started. It was, uh, it was something that you would learn about and study about and be interested in if uh, learning things was uh, something that you had time to, uh, to do. A lot of times people didn't have time or calories to uh, spend towards creating. Some people, it took all of their calories just to uh, keep moving a day at a time. So it was, uh, this was uh, a time where uh, um, knowledge was highly prized and uh, art forms were uh, exploding. So like I have said earlier, it was thought that uh, because of the influence of uh, lithograph and because of the influence of uh, um, the paintings that were being done, these monks would have been um, inspired by the trees that they saw in what was called uh, Southern Song paintings. So let's see, Southern song paintings and that means uh, monochromatic paintings that uh, were primarily used with one color to the brush on the palette and it was just done light or dark to uh, create depth the illusion of mist and it's more what we don't see or what we can barely see than what we can see like in this example we see our figures here we see our trees but in the background we can barely make out what looks like a, r a rise and a ridge and a cliff through the mist and then in, there seems to be a little bit of foreground here but it fades off into whatever is going on here and we can barely see that as this yard outside of his fenced area, that is our, our foreground, it kind of wraps around and fades off into the distant and our eye just automatically just invents all that pathway that is there, like it invents the pathway that goes up to that peak and that point. And it was the inspiration of the trees that you would see in paintings like this that was said uh, to have inspired the uh, monks for which they uh, started doing the uh, collecting of trees. Now, that was not the name at that time. Literati was not the name for a tree with no lower limbs and three basic trunk movements. That sort of a loose definition of literati, very little uh, in the way of lower limbs, everything happening in the top third. Um, but that literati is not what that meant at the time. At the time in China, that was their word for uh, uh, a learned person's bonsai tree. Had they had a Japanese black pine formal upright, that would have been a literati uh, because it would have been a uh, Japanese formal upright owned by a learned person. So it wasn't until later that uh, in like the 1800s that the definition of literati in Japan began to switch more over to what you see here. And this is more indicative, <clears throat> whereas typical bonsai trees they tend to, uh, everything is about discipline and structure. Maybe you sort a hundred seedlings, you pick out a couple that are the best ones and over the years you cultivate those, you make no mistakes. These specimens then are deemed worthy amongst the other specimens and then you're off to the show. Next thing you know, you're in 
uh, some big show in Japan winning all the awards. No, it doesn't really work like that. You're more likely to have a Kentucky Derby winner uh, in your barn than uh, that. However, that is kind of loosely how that goes about. Whenever you're talking about, you know, typical uh, top flight bonsai trees, the best of the best. Literati is more whimsical than that. You can have branches that cross. You can have no taper, like no taper, as in my other tree there, no taper. You can also uh, break other rules as you need to. The bottom line is it needs to be a, uh, an attractive tree. So breaking the rules uh, won't be any good to you if, you're, if the, uh, the final product is it pleasing? Just like following all the rules won't really please you either. If uh, if it's not ple if the end result is not pleasing, so uh, a lot of times uh, with literati, you will see three basic trunk movements. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, a shari or uh, a gin, uh, like uh, my ponderosa out on the balcony has a long, long, long shari and those twists in it. Whereas the specimen trees are like walking down a, a, a red carpet on uh, on Oscar night. The uh, literati is more worldly. It shows its scars. It shows that it's had to cling to the side of a rock to hang in there. It shows where the sun didn't shine on both sides of its street it had to take what it could get and wake up tomorrow and fight again another day and that's where its beauty is it's not considered to be less because it hasn't had the perfect life it's considered to be um absolutely superb because uh its ability to hang in there and come back on another day just like uh my 175 year old uh, Ponderosa. So uh, that guy, that guy is absolutely beautiful for, for its faults, for nothing else. The way it twists, the way it has these long sharis that spiral around, the way it has these gins for old limbs have had to give themselves up because they weren't getting enough light to hang in there and do the and do the support. It's had it's been shaped by a pretty good bonsai master, but it's also been shaped by wind and snow and not quite enough rain. And uh, and it's beautiful because of it. I think that's why I love this form or this uh this approach to bonsai, most of all, and it's probably, yeah, it's why I have three of these out of eight pine are, uh, are literati. And, uh, and I'm just lucky that two of them are Yamadori. I'm not a big, <clears throat> um, I'm not big pro Yamadori. I think a lot of times uh, we end up with Yamadori that we can't maintain. And then that's just one less tree. Uh, I know I'll certainly be hurt if something happens to these guys, but I pretty much made sure that I was getting trees that already had been well established. And I'm pretty sure that what we're doing right now, our trees are pretty happy with. And I'm pretty sure that I've got enough resources around me that should things look a little dicey at any point. And right now everything's going good for going on a couple of years now. Uh, I've got enough resources around me that they'll be able to talk me down should something happen. But anyway, that's our little run on uh, Literati. As it stands, this would be an example of what the style Literati became. Instead of being the general term for bonsai in China, this type no lower branches, uh, two or three, or three or four basic directional changes in the trunk. Um, 
minimal branching, uh, mostly at the top. Uh, this is a little grown out also because I'm feeding it for the shorter needles I want. So, but, uh, so right now these guys are a little healthy and they're supposed to be a little sparser than that. It's by design. I want them to produce more needles so that they'll get smaller needles and then I'll cut them back to where they uh, look minimalist uh, once again. So that's kind of by design. But then in the 70s, in the 70s or 80s in Japan, something began to happen. A little post-modern interpretation. So we've gone from literati, meaning trees for learned people, which would have meant any bonsai tree out of China, to something a little bit more post-modern. I believe the name of this tree is Walk Like an Egyptian. Uh, and that is something that literati and since the uh, 70s and 80s has uh, one interpretation of what it has become. You can do uh, so. All things are uh, all things are open and equal. There are no real rules in literati. I would say, moreover, there are uh, guidelines. You can color outside the lines with literati. You can cross branches with literati. You can uh, have no taper to speak of with literati. The bowls for literati are either fall into one of two basic categories. Either one, they tend to be round, they tend to be thick, they tend to be brown, or uh, they tend to be brown or maroon or purple. Uh, a lot of times they uh, add ballast to the taller trees because they're thick, they're kind of clunky looking, they're almost never fancy think feed bowls for farm animals uh that was i believe the uh original design to a lot of those to some of those uh bonsai pots and i believe that was would have been then describing the pots that they were using uh, a lot of times you see that now not in the one i'm showing you here but quite often you will see uh, round, shallow bonsai pots that are fairly thick uh, clay and uh, they do kind of act to hold a plant up so that it doesn't tip over if it's uh, kind of if it's kind of uh, tall and lanky for instance, right? Uh, but those, but they do tend to be shallow. So uh, yeah, this one I, I kind of like that pot. I uh, I don't know when it comes time to do a repot on that one. I'm pretty sure I'll go back with that pot. That's not a bad looking little pot for uh, for hoss. So that's the pots. That is uh, the design aesthetic sort of behind it. They're supposed to look like they have been through things and seen things not necessarily delicate and manicured the way the way some of the uh, more showier trees are. It's a slightly different approach, but it's a little freer approach. And it's certainly one that uh, I can appreciate. And uh, that's why, uh, that's why uh, I have that many, I suppose, literally. I did have one more. I had a, I was trying to train my uh, small bald cypress, uh, which is called Little Spoon, into a literati. It was a twin trunk, but it kind of lost its proportion. So I bailed out and now I'm just doing something a little bit more typical. Maybe they're in the early going, as simple as this looks, in the rules of bonsai, uh, amongst the people who uh, ran in that crowd, there was a rule in the heyday of literati that uh, you were to go through a certain rite of passage before you were to attempt 
alliterati. I don't know whether that means you, I guess that means you could water one or you could do the needle pluck or whatever, uh, or, you know, maintain leaf count or whatever, but you weren't to style one or design one until you knew something. And I don't know what would happen if like the Yamadori police would, I mean, the literati police would compound on your, compound on your pave, your cave door and, um, uh, haul everybody away for uh, misuse of uh, literati or literati without a license or what. But yeah, uh, they were awful snooty about how you were uh, supposed to go about uh, about designing your tree that was supposed to be a little freer in design. They just wanted you to be a smarter person to get to do it. Otherwise, uh, I guess they figured the wrong crowd would, I don't know. <laughs> It, was, it seemed like they were kind of snobbish back then, but um, I think that this is not a tree that displays the very perfect or the very best of everything the way a perfect specimen of something would be. But this is more that shows the beauty of uh, what life does to things as they go through life and what uh, and what they look like, and it celebrates that look. To that end, I think we are all uh, literati and we're all um, and we're all beautiful so that is it and that's my little Labor Day spill on uh, literati um, bonsai it is uh, kind of nice to move a little bit away from that stuff which is so uh otherwise can be looking a little stuffy uh today is the first day like i said of our three-day holiday it is also the first day of what i said yesterday would be some really warm temperatures i do have wet towels uh t-shirts dish towels uh placed on the sunny side of the clay pots to keep them cooled and uh we did our little water early, so everybody's happy. Our temperatures now, a little after four, have already broken. They're starting to drop. Tomorrow will be even, will be brutal. I'm not gonna say more brutal. I think we kind of got away light today. Tomorrow is said to be brutal. The next day more so. So yeah, like and subscribe if you guys have not already. Um, I'm going to do more with ponderosas. I'll probably, do a little bit more with some oak trees. I see more uh, shohin and mame in our future. I have definitely have room for a few more trees. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna keep going. Uh, these are my bald cypress. They have been in development for about two years now. They probably have another maybe three to go before I make before I can turn all those sticks into taper. That might be a little optimistic, but yeah, I think we're on the right track. Um, maybe even sooner had I been better at it in the first two years, but I think we're on the right track now as far as not doing things that look good on the day, but maybe hold us up. You know, sometimes I would style the tree and go, yeah, that looks pretty cool. Uh, but in, in the in, end of things, I was kind of slowing down momentum. We're not doing that now. We're letting it just, um, we're letting it make three beautiful trees for a grove of cypress trees. So yeah, that's pretty much us. Our next drop will be likely our Monday drop. And I hope you guys have a fantastic holiday. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. Frida Reba Darcy appreciates you and uh, happy holidays.